Wallace Kendall has an impossible job, but he sees the possibilities. He works with street kids, the hardest cases, the kids who've burned every bridge, who seem to have no hope of getting off the streets. Well, Wallace Kendall deals in hope. It's what he gives to street kids, along with a healthy dose of guidance and patience. And when those things don't get through, he offers more hope, more guidance, more patience. Here's Judy Piercy with Kendall's Kids. I know lots of people that come down here and stay in these spots, you know what I mean? Wallace Kendall is out on the streets of Edmonton nearly every night of the week. This is one of the better spots. That's when his kids need him most. Show me your vent. Show me your vent. Where's your vent? You've never gone up yeah, there, have I've you? Gone. You slept up there? Holy. I know, I have. No, but yeah, people have? These teenagers have well, already been kicked out of most shelters. They live in the underworld of parkades. Take hey, care, eh? Thank Thanks you. For really Thank you for <laughs> Don't get arrested, okay? <laughs> See you. Bye. Bye. Nobody's here to bother them. You don't see any people here to bother you. There's no staff yelling at you. There's nobody telling you to go to bed. They're not treating you like a 10 year old. Uh, and you can be nasty here and you can be dirty here and you can be mean here and you can do drugs here. And nobody's gonna get mad at you. That's why they're here. Most people have given up on these kids, but not Wallace. There's so many of them are gonna be brilliant. And they are going to, but you know what? If we want that perfect world, then we can't have those kids. We'd have to get rid of them. We'd have to somehow let them fall into the gutter and become those nameless, faceless people that we see still walking around the alleys with shopping carts. We know, we're not going to let that happen. Uh, I'm not, if I can help it anyways. Elizabeth hasn't ended up in the parkades. She's 16 and still in care of social services. But the only place that will take her at night is the youth emergency shelter. It's not too homey, but it's not home at all. Elizabeth hasn't had a real home since she was 12. Her father left town, and she was already living in a group home when she learned her mother died. Elizabeth refused to believe it. I wanted to see my mom. I remember I went in, I walked out of the room and I went around, and there's this hallway and there's like the second door on the right. I went in there and my mom was laying there. And until that moment, I didn't believe that she was gone. Elizabeth has bounced from one group home to another. So far, she's been kicked out of 39 places. The problem is, she's angry and violent. What happened at your last place? <laughs> I beat up my roommate because I didn't like her. No, because she pissed me off. So I just freaked out one day. I'm like, that's it. I've had enough of her shit. I just jumped on her, I just started feeding her shots. And then she put the stuff, Chatty pulls me off her and I start kicking her in the face because I was still mad. And I gave her one really good kick in the stomach. They put me in a shelter. What? I think I wish you felt better, Elizabeth. I'm sure I feel better. So where'd you stay all night? Uh, Shauna's house. Did you? Yeah, we went drinking last night. You did? What did you drink? We drank a 2-6 uh, raspberry twist turn-off. And we drank, between the six of us, we shared a 40 of our night. But I didn't do any drugs last night, so that's Oh, that's good. good, that's good. This message for Bob. It's Wallace Kendall from My Human. Uh, Bob, you phoned something about your son. Wallace is Elizabeth's last hope. He's always got time to look after her. She walked into this place eight months ago, now she's become a fixture. It's a place to fucking let away my pissed offness. I don't know. It's a place just to be me and I don't have to like act a certain way so I don't get in shit. She has to be getting mad sometimes and swear at you maybe. And she's got a great vocabulary using the F word. She wants love, number one, respect. She wants to be unconditionally accepted who she is as a human being. 
She wants you to know that she has bad days, and not every day is going to be perfect. Are we only here to have kids that have good days? I don't think so. So I, I love this kid, and she knows it, and she, she knows she's got me. <laughs> And that's wonderful because that is part of the whole thing. You know, you, you've got to know that you can be got. we got to go find the kids. Wallace has all the time in the world for teenagers like Elizabeth. Up to 60 kids walk through these doors every day. Wallace Kendall runs his outreach program called iHuman from an abandoned warehouse in Edmonton's inner city. It runs on a shoestring budget cobbled together with grants and a big donation from an anonymous donor in Calgary. He uses music and art to reach the most unreachable youth. Almost all are drug addicts. Most have criminal records. Many have a history of violent behavior. So I like to take the, the gem of the person, whatever that might be, and find what it is, and then enrich upon that and give them, give them the encouragement so they can soar like an eagle. I mean, there's talent that I've discovered, or had self-discovered, that is absolutely immense. I mean, it, and people look at these guys and they just see the exterior thing that pisses them off. You know, they're either aggressive, they may spit at them, they may throw things, they may say stuff, call you a bitch or something like that. But what they don't see is take those behaviors away and then you find and discover the gem. You know, they would go to the ends of the earth for him, which is what he's done for them. Leslie Farr is a youth worker with the John Howard Society. Her most desperate clients blossomed after she referred them to Wallace Kendall. There is the ones that are just, there's nowhere for them. They're the ones that have fallen through the cracks. They're, they're homeless. They're so street involved. They're so addicted. And, and nobody, there's no more services that can help them or want to help them sometimes. Nearly everyone had given up on Tyler Emerson, too. He's been in and out of jail for most of his teenage years. At 18, he's trying to overcome his criminal past. You know, like, I, I jack some people who I know if they got a hold of me, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. I'd be in a cedar box in the ground. And, like, when you get that far into it, you, that's all you care about. So you start doing things that you normally wouldn't do. I messed with a lot of people that I shouldn't have. When Tyler was at rock bottom, Leslie Farr called Wallace Kendall. I was concerned after my office closed at 4.30 what was happening with him and uh, on weekends and things like that. Where is he going to go? And for me, it was a place that I knew he could go anytime. You could walk in there in whatever condition he was in and somebody there would make sure that he had food and talk to him. and. And, you know, he couldn't stay the night or anything, but it's somewhere where they could try to help him problem solve in that moment, no matter what condition he's in. you you ever seen a movie of a baboon tribe and there's one aggressive baboon? Well, he was that baboon, eh? And, but I, I, I immediately loved the guy just because I liked his behavior, because he thinks he's the tough guy. So, you know, I thought that's kind of cool. Now let's work with that. Let's see who's tougher, me or Tyler. So it was kind of a challenge, and you know, I, but I didn't go after Tyler with just toughness. I went after him with trying to be understanding of him being a tough guy, why he had to be a tough guy, why he thought he needed that behavior to be a tough guy, and what was the posturing about that. So he might scare everybody else, and he'd come up and maybe get in my face and be right in front of me, like, ah, you know, just like a baboon would do. But I didn't give anything to that behavior. I just either joked about it or came back at, you know, do something, I'll just punch you right out, buddy, you know. And so we had that sort of uncomfortable space between us, but it was still, it was a space. And that space was enough to keep both of us from doing anything. Wallace is a tough old man. Tyler and his girlfriend Charm started using drugs as adolescents. Both almost died from overdoses. But when Charm ended up in hospital, Wallace finally got through to them. Wallace came at us in a different way. He didn't try and tell us, this is what you have to do, this is what blah, 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 you know. All he did was help us see what it was doing to us and give us the choice and give us the power to do what we chose to do. That's a big problem is 
with drug addicts never and homeless people, to us. He, he never he us. never turned away. He'd never turn away. He'd get mad, you know. He'd get, get mad. mad and he'd kick you out of the studio. For, he, he get out of the studio, never come back. He'd come back in an hour and he'd be like, okay, come talk to me, you know. It took several tries before Tyler and well, Charm finally cleaned up and turned their lives around. Looking clean. back now, they, they realize clean. why they made you know, Wallace so live, angry. You know? But it's because he cares so much that, you know, he walks into the washroom and there's four guys smoking speed in the washroom of a place that's and trying to help you. And on the counter with a glass pipe, you know. Yeah, like, he's going to get mad, right? Because he's spending, you know, you call Wallace at 4 o'clock in the morning, he's going to answer his phone. And if you need help, he's going to come help you. And there's no ifs, ands, or buts. His cell phone never stops ringing. This time, it's a young prostitute who wants to get off the street. Hello? Hi. Why don't we put you back in safe house? And then I'll do your, we'll do your meeting on Friday with Amber. She's, she thinks you should be at safe house. They, they want you back at safe house. So why don't I pick you up and we'll go back to safe house? Oh, fuck, you're kidding. Whereabouts in Millwoods? Yeah? So, okay, then to, then to do this, because uh, I've got to find a kid, eh, at the moment, so to do this, how about if I pick you up at 5.30, does that work? Okay, just a minute, where am I going to find you, do you have an address? Okay, okay, I'll be there around 5.30. Unlike most okay. social workers, okay, Jessica, he doesn't turn off his yeah, phone at like, night. Uh, that's, uh, again, you've got to remember the thinking of the kid. Uh, they are looking for family at all times. And family is unconditional, it should be. And you can phone your parent at 2 a.m. if you have to and drive them crazy. But that's what they're all looking for. And that's what is hard to deliver in, in the system because, you know, people want a life. They don't want to be hassled, and at 4.30 when they go home, they go home, and the phones stop. And for most kids uh, that need help, guess what? It's after 4.30 they need help, or it's in the middle of the night they need help, or it's on Saturday and Sunday they need help when the system is down. And that's because the system works to the average hours like bankers, and that's, this is not a banking system. Even on his day off, at home, no. his cell phone never stops. Okay, I'll see you at 4 o'clock. Okay, bye. bye. <laughs> but for his own sanity, this is where he draws the line. The home he shares with his wife is off limits to the kids. He tries to balance his work with his art. I don't depict people as people. I depict them as metaphors of people. Eh? So I use different forms to do that and you can see those forms are very uh, sculptural in a sense, eh? And they're not, you know, I don't worry about the detail because that would take away from what I'm trying to give you as the concept. Like this one is the alchemist and that's done with, a, with a gelatin on canvas. And it's about passing knowledge to the person who's waiting behind to collect that knowledge from this person. But again, it's not a person in say, it's a concept. His talent as an artist kept him from serious trouble as a teenager. And I wasn't very good in school and I had fights with teachers all the time. I had raging fights in the school system with teachers because I'm basically more likely fairly dyslexic and that was a real problem for me and I didn't know that, of course. Wallace's art got him into university. He trained as a teacher and spent years teaching and doing social work in developing countries. But he ended up back in Edmonton to fulfill yeah, a promise he made to himself like when he was an angry teenager. If a kid ever came to me and said, I need some help with a problem, I would try to fulfill that mandate of myself because I, uh, nobody listens when you have problems when you're a kid, it seems, or they don't listen carefully enough. Kendra Sherrick can relate. It was her art that got her through a life of abuse and abandonment. But Wallace's belief in her made her turn her life around. I, I brought my sketchbook to show him like what I had. And he's like, oh, you're talented, you're brilliant, and you should be a star. You know? you, he'd always boast about how great you are. And I was like, nobody's ever told me how great I was. 
At 20, Kendra has a full-time job. She's even up for a promotion. She's come a long way from living on the streets. At 14, she was homeless after her mother committed suicide. No one was there for her, except for Wallace Kendall, who got her on track and back into school. He's a resourceful guy, and he's willing to give that to others. He's like a dad, a little father figure for sure. <laughs> yeah, I think of him like a dad. Why? Because he's really supportive. And he's a guy. <laughs> he's up. He's old enough to be wise enough to show me things that I don't know. And that's something I didn't really have a lot of. Kendra dreams of becoming a filmmaker. And tonight, her dream is starting to come true. She's produced and directed a short film. Wallace has helped get her into a mentorship film program. But tonight is bittersweet. It means she's moving on. It's like a little birdie leaving the nest. It's sad and it's, you know, you don't have that anymore. Like I still have Wallace when I need him, but we don't, go for car rides anymore and we don't hang out and we don't talk as much as we used to and that's what I miss. The time that it takes to work with one kid is so huge and there's so many kids so I have cut myself thin there's no doubt about it and she's right about the fact that I don't have as much time to give to her as the dad should give. You know, because the dad process, unfortunately, doesn't ever end. But tonight, Wallace is reveling in being the proud dad. Elizabeth has some pictures and writing on display. She's helping run the show. They want to talk to you about your stuff. They're very impressed. <laughs> and Wallace is using the chance to network to help find another group home that will take Elizabeth in. This is Elizabeth. We, she wants to be in Chemo. Wallace is optimistic about her future, despite her problems. There's no paintbrush big enough to paint this and fix it up. But I think in the realm of things, she's going to be proactive, contribute to society in wonderful, magical ways, creatively and both socially. And I think she'd be a great advocate. She's already done advocacy here that is brilliant helping other kids understand themselves and giving her perspective. We're going to find Shadow. <laughs> In fact, things are looking up. So what we're trying to do is keep the police out of this. Elizabeth and Wallace are on their way to pick up a girl desperately in need of a drug treatment program. She does not know we're coming over. Wallace has been working on her for months. But it was Elizabeth who finally persuaded her friend to try to get off drugs. Come on, what a stupid answer machine. This is Liz and Wallace calling back, so call back. Okay, She's in the back, Shadow. Right. Oh. Hi, Shadow. Did you have a good sleep? Boy, you were so tired yesterday. Okay. We're going to go back to the studio. Yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> back at the iHuman studio, the kids are putting their stories into music. They've been invited to put on a production at Edmonton Citadel Theatre, one of the most important venues in Canada. They have the talent, they have that rawness, that incredible thing, but it's not going to happen for at least three or four years. This, is, this shows you once that trust is built and once that responsibility and the ability to function is given, the sky's the limit. I like to think the people coming through here will be the most significant change makers in the world in the arts, social sciences, and psychology and stuff like that. I think they will become great forces in Canada. And uh, I think Canada's lucky, and Edmonton's lucky, that there's this enrichment. Yeah. 
Wallace Kendall is trying to get these kids to dream of even having a future. He's managed to get hundreds of them off the streets. Now all he needs is to find places for them to live. For The National, I'm Judy Piercy in Edmonton. Please stay with us when we come back. A new feature to complement Rex Murphy's point of view.